I got to tell you, I'm thrilled there's no podium up here. I'm always fearful of the fact it's going to be taller than me when I get up here. So <laughs> all you're seeing is hands coming out everywhere. And if I was Ryan, it was the top of my head, it'd be fine, but uh, that's not going to work. So uh, I'm here to talk to you about the promise of prosthetics in the 21st century. Uh, obviously, prosthetics has been a lot in the news re uh, recently, seeing all kinds of advancements come into our profession. Uh, everything from accelerometers, from cell phones, scientific techniques, and uh, you saw the presentation from Dean a while ago showing the arm, which I uh, have some video to show you of that. So uh, all in all, it's a very promising time for, for amputees and people that have suffered from limb loss. My talk, I'd like to just take a minute to tell you why I have a unique perspective in terms of what amputees are able to do after leaving our facility. I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the technology that's out there, but most importantly, what I want to show you is the impact that it's made in people's lives. Um, even though I am the president, uh, my main passion is taking care of amputees. And the people that do that are considered certified prosthetists. And I'm going to ask you to say it slowly if you're ever going to repeat it for obvious reasons. <laughs> <clears throat> Certified prosthetists are specifically trained and educated to provide prosthetic care, including design, fabrication, and fit of external limb prostheses. So here's an example of one of us taking a mold of another amputee. And the perspective here is that uh, we meet amputees very early on in the rehab process, sometimes even before they have their leg amputated. So we're really able to see what they're able to do after they leave, and it's unexpected on two levels. A lot of the times what we see is unexpected, but more importantly, what that person is able to do is unexpected. So basically, as prosthetists, uh, we design artificial limbs, and there's a bunch of components that we can able to pick out there from. This is actually an artificial knee. After we're able to pick out the components that basically fit somebody's lifestyle, uh, we then fabricate the prosthesis. And then lastly, after it's fabricated, we'll do the actual fitting where that person comes into our office and we'll fit the prosthesis. We analyze their gait to make sure that they walk properly. But what we're really trying to make happen is what happens after they leave. And that's where some of those unexpected results come. So I'm going to introduce you to a few people that show this in a different way. This is uh, somebody who's wearing a running prosthesis that actually used it to get into ballet. The middle picture is a picture of a prosthesis that's actually powered now. This is actually the beginning of the bionic revolution. And over on the right is uh, similar to something you saw a little while ago in terms of an upper extremity prosthesis that's allowed a level of function for people that just hasn't been attained before. So the first person I'd like you to meet is Lisa. Uh, Lisa is a model who, um, you can probably can't tell necessarily what she's missing here, but if you look real closely, she's missing her fingers on both of her hands. Uh, one of them is behind her back, but the one on the left here, you can see uh, that she's missing her fingers. And it's just a beautiful picture that I think shows the power of the human spirit because a lot of the times without pointing that out, you'd never notice it. What's really unexpected about this though is Lisa's missing both of her legs below her knees. And these are called high definition silicone covers. You can see them right here in terms of how realistic they look. She's a bilateral below the knee amputee. You can see she's been amputated just below her knees right there. And because she was a model, it was very important that she could get into a set of legs that allowed her to continue being a model. And when you look at the two outside pictures, nobody could argue that she shouldn't be a model. Uh, what goes along with this is in order to be a model, she needs to stay in shape. So she has, and I apologize for the picture, but um, this is Lisa as well, running on the Charles River in Boston. These are a set of prosthetic running legs obviously that she uses to run and stay in shape. She runs about three to five miles a day. And uh, thankfully she doesn't ask us to go with her because uh, I don't think we'd keep up. 
These legs you may recognize because they're the same legs worn by a guy by the name of Oscar Pistorius. And Oscar, if you don't remember, was disqualified from the last Olympics because he was said to have an unfair advantage, which made us chuckle a little bit in the, in the profession. But what they were trying to prove that because of these legs that he wears, he's actually able to generate more energy in those than people with biological legs. Well, they ended up disproving that, and Oscar was able to try and qualify for the last Olympics, of which he wasn't able to do. Real good knows, as in August, in the World and Track Field Championships, I believe they were in Korea, uh, Oscar made the semifinals against what's known as able-bodied people. That's how they refer to us. Um, and he beat 22 of the fastest guys in the world. He's coming up for one other qualifier, and if he beats the time of, I believe, 14 minutes, I mean, I'm sorry, 14, uh, 41 seconds, uh, he's going to qualify for the Olympics in London. So most likely, uh, you will see him uh, in the next Olympics running against able-bodied people, which you want to talk about unexpected. How could you ever think somebody who's missing their both legs would not only end up in the Olympics, but be able to compete against able-bodied people and beat them? So it's a time in our profession that things are being talked about in such a way that's somewhat surprising in terms of amputees having an advantage because of the technology that they have. Next is the, kind of the beginning of the bionic revolution. And it's easy to see when Oscar and his running legs, those don't have any power to them. They're basically stored energy as he runs on them. This is a powered prosthesis. This is actually a battery that has a lot of power. And inside the foot module here is a set of motors and gears and springs that mimic our anatomical leg. And I'm going to show you a video uh, of Stefan. And the next video that shows up is him going to be walking up a hill. Because these powered prosthesis, if I watched somebody walking on level ground, you wouldn't see the advantage as much if you watch somebody walk uphill. So we did a comparison. The next video is going to be Stefan walking in a regular prosthesis. And then the video after that is going to be with the powered foot. So while you're watching him, uh, do this. This is without power. And if you notice, his toes staying up in the air, kind of hunched over a little bit. But the big difference is when he comes down the hill. You can see he's just sort of putting extra pressure on his left side as he's kind of pounding on it, trying to get off his prosthetic foot as fast as he can. Stefan's in his mid 30s. He lost his leg in an industrial accident. And he has two young children at home and had been telling us that he couldn't keep up with them. This powered foot now, uh, when you see it as when he goes up the hill, he's standing straight up. See, you can see his heel touching on the way up as he goes right up. And that is just powering him right up the hill. Coming down, you can see his whole foot gets on the ground. There's really equal time on both sides. He's not pounding on his good foot. Uh, and he would tell us that because of the power, he feels he could walk up and down that hill all day. A normal amputee exerts about two to three times the energy just to do the same thing as you and I. The fact that he can do that and use less energy is really a testament in terms of what the technology does and what it's going to do in the future. You can imagine what it would be like for bilateral amputees for walk for hours on time and not be tired. Uh, the next thing uh, we're going to show you is that you may recognize this is some upper extremity innovations. Um, and I do want to talk a little bit about the collaborative part of this. You saw this arm a little while ago in Dean's uh, presentation. Uh, we have the honor of collaborating on this project because our expertise as certified prosthetists, again, I say it slow, uh, is the interface. And the interface is the part that goes on somebody's body. Uh, this is a good friend of mine. His name is Chuck. He lost both of his arms in an electrical accident 26 years ago. He has, on his right side, 
Uh, he has no shoulder. He's considered a four-quarter amputee. And on his left side, all he has is a shoulder and a very short residual limb. This is the first time that in 26 years he's ever had two arms. Uh, one on the left is more of a conventional body power design. Uh, you can see a, a split hook here, which is uh, recognizable. But on, on his right side uh, is the arm that's being developed um, uh, at DECA. And I'm going to show you a few videos of him working with this. And uh, one thing that I do want to note, note in this, and it's from knowing Chuck for a long time, it's the power of the human spirit. You know, we can talk about technology, we can talk about advancements, but a lot of what happens here comes down to that person. Uh, and you can just see the intensity on his face, and what's great about this picture is that he made that model. Uh, this is an example of uh, a type of technology. The reason it's on a mannequin is because it's so new, it hasn't been released for human testing yet. But you can just watch. Oh, sorry if you don't mind going back for me. I didn't play that. So you can see as the arm comes up, the bottle stays level. And it may not seem like much, but most amputees can't take a drink themselves because their wrist is fixed. So you can imagine if their wrist is fixed, it comes up to their mouth, starts pouring all over them before they're able to drink it. Um, this will now be going on Chuck so he can try it. I thought it was good for everybody to see. This is Chuck again. Uh, the, the, the box does have a lot of weight in it, just so you know, there is a lot of weight. He's trying to get his prosthetic hand on the right situated perfectly. He gets a split hook on the other side. Then you'll see him close the hand on the box right there and lift it up. And you'll see him shake it a little bit. And everything is very stable on his body in terms of what he was able to do. And even kind of the grin on his face uh, kind of says it all. Uh, he's never really carried anything before as a person with one arm. Uh, the funniest thing was when he came home, he went home with this for two weeks. And he came back and told us, asking us if we could tune it down a little bit, because his wife was asking him to do so many things in the house he couldn't stand it. <laughs> Uh, this is pretty interesting. This is Chuck um, opening a can of Coke. And again, it may not seem unexpected, but when you have no arms, no hands, and can open a Coke for yourself, this is pretty amazing. Power drill. What guy doesn't want to use a power drill? This is a grip that's specifically set up for him to have a powered index finger. So he's actually, you can run that again, Andy. Um, so you'll see this part of it in the drill. There's him opening the can again. And in the drill, his index finger is the only thing that's powered. So he's able to hold on to the drill and hit the trigger at the same time. That's another model that he can build. And there you are seeing him uh, put the drill in there while he's holding it with his other arm. This is Ron. He is missing both of his hands below his elbow from an electrical accident as well. Uh, he is also a veteran. And he's doing something that's never been done with split hooks, and that's use a pair of scissors. Now, obviously, Ron's not going to be going home and doing a lot of arts and crafts based on looking at him right there. But here he is talking about how amazed that he is that he has the ability to do that. Um, and I had to take the audio out because he was using some fairly expressive words about how <laughs> unbelievable it was he could do that and didn't feel it was a good place for me to share that with you. Um, the next part is really what I want to show you. And this is the human aspect of things. These are people that have had the benefit of some of the things that we've just talked about, which is really the, the most important thing I, I think about technology. This is Carter. 
uh, somebody we've been seeing uh, since he was born. He was born without a left arm. He's amputated on his left leg below his knee, and he only has three fingers on his right hand. What's the significance of this? He couldn't get on a swing before all of this because he didn't have an arm to hold on to because he only had one leg. His mother would tell us how hard it was to watch him be at a playground and not be able to get on a swing. Is it unexpected on some level? Maybe, maybe not. Was it unexpected on their level? Absolutely. Bob, my best friend, my golfing partner, missing both legs below his knees because he had an accident on an aircraft carrier during the Vietnam War. He's devoted his life to going around the country to teach physical therapists how to use golf as part of their rehab routine. Uh, this is Neil. He's a firefighter that lost his leg in the line of duty, uh, talking to a, uh, one of our patients named Sean, who's also a little boy missing his leg above the knee, who's aspiring to be a firefighter someday. So Neil brought him in. He, they're sitting on a fire truck together, and Neil's kind of mentoring him uh, to follow that path. Uh, Jason, who's sitting down on the ground there, uh, is actually somebody who lost their leg 20 years ago. Uh, he went uh, back to school to become a certified prosthetist like myself. Uh, he also won a gold medal in the Nagano Paralympics as a tri-tracker. Uh, and he's uh, incredibly uh, level of inspiration that he has for people that come in that are going through the same thing he has. And he's used his, what happened to him as a way to give back to everybody else. Monica um, ended up in the hospital. She's, uh, I don't watch Oprah, but she was just on uh, Oprah Winfrey as a program about super moms. And she went in pregnant with her third child, developed a infection and lost both of her hands and both of her feet. Um, that's her in her house uh, enjoying one of the new prosthetic cans. And she likes coffee, obviously. This is Peter Cannell. He's a Vietnam veteran that uh, lost his leg in the war, teaching another little boy. You can see his right leg he's missing below his knee, and he's teaching him how to ride a bike. There's George down there. George, before he lost his leg, picked out this mountain that he ever said if he could climb that mountain after his leg amputated, he will have felt that he beat the whole thing. This was a, a little time later. He sent us this picture with a nice note saying that he had climbed to the top of the mountain. Over in the corner is Frank Hardner. He's another Vietnam veteran. This is the event they have down on 1000 uh, Elm Street where they have people rappel over the side of the building. He's a right below the knee amputee. You really can't see it that well. But again, uh, the thought of him being able to do this and accomplishing it was, uh, was a huge benefit for him. Next picture up here in the left, another Vietnam veteran uh, whose passion is riding a bike. And uh, this was modified so he could stick his prosthesis into the clip of the bike and rides about 100 miles a week. This is Doug. He's a bilateral amputee whose family is in the fishing business. And it was very difficult after he's lost his legs not to be able to help his family out. Now he's back, obviously, helping pulling things out of the water and feeling real good about himself. This is Mike. He's a PGA Tour pro who lost his left arm above his elbow. He's a PGA Tour pro. Obviously, he wants to play golf. This is a specially made prosthesis that allows him to do that. This is Sean. He's missing his leg right uh, below his knee on his right side. It was important for him to want to surf. Unexpected? I think so. This is Jennifer. She wanted to paint the ceiling in her house. Uh, and again, it was unexpected for her to think that she could ever get up on a ladder. And if you lost your leg, you may think that too. We have these for people to see so they realize life isn't over. This is Jonathan. Uh, when we heard he was a photographer, we're thinking photographer. And then we sent us this, this picture, and we realized, boy, he needs a lot of stability in his prosthesis based on what he does as a photographer. He wasn't able to continue doing this until uh, he had the technology that allowed him to get out there and feel safe. Kirk uh, was a collegiate wrestler who lost his leg, who wanted to be able to run. 
Uh, again, it sounds so simple, but for somebody who's lost their leg without this technology, running was just a, a distant thought. Tim works on really big engines, obviously, uh, and needed the stability so he could get back to work. Is it unexpected to get back to work? Sometimes it is. Lastly, here's Chuck. Uh, again, uh, you can see him from before. Uh, there he is using a power drill. Again, for a guy with no arms to be using a power drill, uh, pretty unexpected. I'd like to leave you with this final thought. And I've been able to witness it, and I can attest to it. When you have a good idea and good, caring people that can collaborate with one another, we can change the world one person at a time. Thank you very much. Thank you.